So what state am I in? <laughs> state of denial. <laughs> Not a good place to be, right? Yes, yeah, state of exhaustion. Amen, amen. Well, God bless you, saints. Uh, Brother David, thank you for that timely word. Um, obviously, brothers and sisters, we're uh, seeking to be on the front line of this battle. Uh, to end a terrible evil. Uh, but we are up against uh, a very cunning foe. And uh, one thing I've learned about this battle and fighting this enemy who has come to kill, steal, and destroy is if he can't get you going bad through overt sin and rebellion, he will get you going good. It's called self-righteousness. It's called spiritual pride. Back in the day of Operation Rescue, we, were, we weren't abolitionists. We were turbo Christians. We were the elites. And it wasn't just the government that came after us to shut us down. It was God taking us to the woodshed to beat the hell out of us. And... Uh, it would be wise to take heed to some of the things you heard this evening because we are literally fighting a cunning, cunning foe who has destroyed more men and women of integrity and virtue than you and I in this room. So we just need to really take heed to some of the things that were shared here this evening. Okay, uh, I've come from Texas. I wasn't sure I was going to make it um, for a number of reasons. First, we got the day wrong <laughs> after I made all my glorious plans to be with you. Uh, but my schedule was such I couldn't change it. And then when I got to the airport today, uh, I thought I was going to have a you know time to get here, and then they postponed it and delayed it for. A, couple of more hours and I was like God you just love making things very interesting but uh, thanks be to God made it here uh, my lovely bride Kendra and my kiddo sends greetings all the way from Texas uh, they're at home and sure love and miss them um, but I was asked to come here for a specific purpose and that is to minister specifically on the doctrine of the lesser magistrate and the abolition of abortion. Now, I don't know how much we've gone into this topic uh, today. I'm sure it was touched upon, but I, I hope to go maybe just a little deeper in how important this truly is. Because just to share my heart with you personally, Operation Rescue, Operation Save America, um, did fight the battle from a principled position. Uh, it was no compromise, no incrementalism, no apology, you know, full-on pro-life, you know what I mean? And, um, and we kind of fought the battle mainly on the streets, at the death camps, and in the culture. Politically, we understood that what the pro-life movement was offering up was was theologically, spiritually sinking sand. It was broken cisterns. It was something that violated the word of God, and by violating the word of God, it violated our conscience. And so we really never got involved in the battle politically. And it wasn't until a young man back there, Russell Hunter, and uh, Pastor Matt Chuella, who wrote this book called The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrate, where the political light bulb got turned on. Boop! We can actually take these principles that we believe in, that is solid word of God, and we can actually now take these principles and begin to apply it in the political realm. And... Um, 
And I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, now I know, listen, I know sometimes we feel like we're an ant going up against a tidal wave of evil. But I got to tell you, this toothpaste is out of the tube. It really is. This is gaining momentum. It is gaining traction. You must understand that. Okay, and I, don't, I just don't want to give you, you know, a bunch of hype here, but I am just telling you, um, there's probably not a week that goes by that I'm not hearing from pastors, I'm not hearing from legislators and filmmakers who are very much interested in what is happening through this movement. I mean pastors that actually want to start mobilizing their churches to get involved in the fray where legislators are actually contacting us <clears throat> and want us to come and sit down with them and talk through these principles of abolition. Now, i got to tell you, being from Operation, Operation Save America, <clears throat> we were, for a, a legislator to sit down with us was like political suicide. They wouldn't touch us with a 10-foot pole. And now all of a sudden, they want to sit down. They want to understand what is going on here. I mean, just, just before I got here, uh, um, it, just in the last two weeks, two more states have contacted us. And we got Bradley Pierce working on bills of abolition. So with everything else that's going on and all the things that you're aware of, I just want you to know, brothers and sisters, this thing is starting to take hold. People are starting to see the justice and the goodness and the rightness of what we're bringing to the table. And what you must understand is you are on the right side of the Lord in this thing. You are on the right side of history. And how many know history is his story? His redemptive plan through the eons of time and through his covenant people. And that's how God moves history forward. Amen. And as David said, it's not an if, it's only a when. And so our job is to continue to be faithful, keep swinging the hammer, keep sowing the seeds, keep watering, keep believing, keep trusting, all right? Keep ministering, keep loving, keep disseminating the truth, amen? Because how many know truth is the only liberating force that God has given his fallen creatures, right, to set us free, Amen. And so what we have now, brothers and sisters, honestly, and this is this is laboring for 46 years now under the weight of blood guiltiness. We finally have something that passes biblical muster, historical muster and constitutional muster. Amen. This is the solid foundation that we are now standing upon. But as the Apostle Paul said, be careful how you build. Be careful how you build. But we got the foundation. Amen. It took a while to get here. But thanks be to God. We do serve a God. Listen. We do serve a God who makes everything beautiful in his time. In his time. And we can trust that, brothers and sisters. We can trust this. Okay. Now, I just want to encourage you. I know there's a lot of things that have been said and there's a lot of evil that we are discussing, okay? And there's a lot of struggles and there's a lot of challenges. But again, take heed to what Brother David say. Listen, we are not just abolitionists. We're Christians. We're husbands. We're fathers. We got responsibilities, right? Amen. We, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and you got to understand, God did not create you to take on and absorb all the evil of this planet. Somebody else actually did that in our stead. His name is Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not te telling you to be lazy and I'm not telling you to, to, to you, know, uh, you know, stop working or, or, or doing these things. But it, 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 there's, I got to tell you, what, what, I've been in this battle a very, very long time, and I took this thing very, very personal for many, many years, and I almost destroyed myself and my family. 
Because I felt if I wasn't doing this 24-7, if I wasn't rescuing every child, I'm failing God and I'm failing this nation. Be careful. Because, you know, sometimes that's how we think more highly of ourselves than we should. And I just want you to know you're not a human doing. You are a human being. We got to be careful we don't value the doing more than the being. So, brothers and sisters, be faithful, be diligent at everything you put your hand to. Whatever you do, you do with all your might as unto the Lord. Whatever you do, husband, father, minister, abolitionist, friend, brother, sister, uncle, aunt, grandpa, grandmother, with all your heart is unto the Lord. Amen. I just want to encourage you there. Okay, so I want to just kind of lay this kind of foundation here first. Kind of give you this example. I want to talk a little bit about evangelism first and tie it in to the abolition of abortion. When it comes to evangelism, there are certain truths that need to be understood if the church is going to be effective in ministering the gospel of the kingdom. Here's one of them. The sinner will never treasure the good news unless the sinner is first convinced of the bad news. In other words, to be a good evangelist, you've got to get the person lost before he can be found. And that means the church has to clearly articulate the human condition. And it's only when we understand that we are conceived in sin, we go astray from the womb, right? We're we're held bondage to the sinful nature. We're under the sway of the evil one. And when we are born, we're heading on a fast track towards a burning hell. That is the human condition. And we must understand that truth because if we don't understand the bad news, we will never, ever treasure the good news, which is Jesus Christ and his abundant pardon to those who repent of their sin and receive him as Lord and Savior. Amen. This same truth applies to the church's duty to interpose to end the American Holocaust. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you're biblical in your orientation, you need to understand there are two sins. There's two abominations that once they reach heaven, you are in deep, deep trouble with Almighty God. And they are child sacrifice, the shedding of innocent blood, and parading our sin like Sodom. America with the blessing of the state and the silent consent of the church, had allowed these abominations to reach heaven. Amen? And we are in deep trouble as a result. Now, here's the amazing thing. You do understand in history, biblically and throughout redemptive history, it's those two specific sins... That once they did reach heaven, God has at time reduced them to burning embers. The fact that you and I get up every day and we breathe and we can see and we can feel and we can still function as a people. How many know that is a tremendous testimony of God's patience and long suffering with us? Amen. But here's the deal. God's justice may be slow in human terms, but it is inevitable. It is like a cosmic grinding stone that moves ever so carefully, grinding to powder every injustice, tyranny, and despotism of men and nations. Men, however, make the foolish mistake to view God's merciful delay in judgment as an approval 
of their evil deeds. I'm going to say that again. Men make the foolish mistake to view God's merciful delay in judgment as approval of their evil deeds. And one of the reasons why I, I believe we have not been reduced to a burning ember is because some of you folks right here in this room and in others. See, it's just been a small, minute segment of the church of Jesus Christ that for whatever reason, God opened their eyes and broke their heart to see this evil. And they have literally been using what they have to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge. And how many know biblically when that is done, you, you can go from Abraham where he's making deals with God about Sodom and Gomorrah. You can, you can go to Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 1. He says, if I just find one man who understands judgment and truth, who would stand before me, I will spare the city. You go to Ezekiel chapter 22, where everybody's corrupt, the priest, the, the prophet, the, the prince, everybody's corrupt, they're doing all this evil, right? And what is God looking for? He's looking for somebody to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge. Why? Because if I don't find somebody, I am going to pour out my judgment upon their Heads. And so you got to understand, brothers and sisters, what you are doing is so critically, critically important when it comes to the survival of this nation. Because we are literally doing things that God has destroyed nations previously. Now, here's the thing. You may be considered an embarrassment to the church. And for sure, the world hates you. But you better know you are highly prized by the one who sent you. You play an extremely important role when it comes to the future of this nation. And you don't. Please do not forget about it. So God's patience is not a denial of his demand for justice. He will not overlook one drop of innocent blood that has been shed and will demand an accounting from our bloodstained and perverted land. And this leads to the topic. When a nation descends into the abyss as America has done, this is very important, brothers and sisters, it is left with two lines of defense to rescue us from the primrose path that leads to prediction, perdition. They are the lesser magistrates and we the people. Please hear what I'm saying to you. Doing what we have done for these last several decades, we have literally put ourselves in a position of national perdition. When it comes to that point in time in history, you've got two lines of defense left. The lesser magistrate and we, the people. That's all we have left. Okay? So if we fail to rally the lesser magistrate to do their duty to place the constitutional chain back on the federal beast, to restore the proper checks and balances, to reign in tyranny and restore our government in its proper role and function, it is left to we, the people. Now, if you study your Bible and if you study your history, when it gets to that point, you are spinning out of control and it leads to blood. So when we're talking about, listen, brothers and sisters, when we're talking about the lesser magistrate doctrine and the abolition of abortion, we're not just talking about ending abortion. 
We are literally talking about our national survival. That's how critically important these issues are that we are bringing to the table. Now, how many besides me, you got children or grandchildren? So when we talk about the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, at least in history, you got to understand we do have this chance. We do have this opportunity because when it's been implemented correctly, it reigned in tyranny, it stopped the tyrant, and it did it in such a way that it averted the just judgment of God and restored righteousness in the land without the shedding of innocent blood. Because how many know what we deserve? Do you, do you understand what we deserve? And so we're still here. We're still functioning. We're still breathing. We're still, we're still able to enjoy life in this nation. So we have this opportunity, brothers and sisters, but because we know God, because we know his character, because we know history, these things that we are bringing to the table are absolutely critical for our national survival. Here's the definition of the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. It teaches that when a superior or high-ranking civil authority makes immoral, unjust, unconstitutional laws or policies, the lower or lesser-ranking civil authority has both a right and duty to refuse obedience to that superior authority, and if necessary, the less authorities may even actively resist the higher authority. The closest that we ever came to this, in my experience, was in uh, Alabama. How many remember Chief Justice Roy Moore? Well, before he was Chief Justice, he was just a judge. While he was in Vietnam, he had carved a set of the Ten Commandments in wood. And when he became a judge in Alabama, he put those Ten Commandments in his courtroom, along with other founding documents of America. Well, the ACLU found out that he had those commandments on there, and they went after him. And being the man he was, he refused to take them down. And I'm, I'm going to be getting into some principles here, brothers and sisters, so stay with me. And so the battle was on. People took their sides. He refused to take it down. It became a media circus. Uh, OSA went there and supported him, stood by his side. In fact, we've been to every one of his battles and stood with him through thick and thin. And so this thing is escalating. It's getting big, a lot of pressure, um, a, lot of, a lot of legal entanglements and, 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 and strategies and all this different stuff. And then finally, the governor of Alabama, his name was Fob James, he stepped into the fray. And this is what he said. He said, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. If anybody steps into that courtroom to remove those Ten Commandments, you're going to do it facing down the barrel of M16s. Well, Bill Clinton, who was president back then, found out the stand that Bob James was taken as a lesser magistrate, as a governor. And so he calls Fob James. And he says, I hear tell this dramatic move that you're making to protect those commandments in that courtroom. He said, yes, sir. He said, well, if you intend on doing that, I'm going to nationalize the Alabama State Guard. Because he was going to bring up the State Guard, the national, you know, the, what do you call them? The State Guard, what is that? 
the National Guard, you know, the Alabama deal, the locals. He was going to, he was going to call them and the troopers to guard that courtroom so nobody took those Ten Commandments. So Bill Clinton finds out about it, and he says, I'm going to nationalize the Alabama State Guard against you. And this is what Fob James said. He said, you do what you think you're going to do, and I'm going to do what I know I'm going to do. Well, somebody blinked, and it wasn't Fob James. Now, the reason why I bring that story up is this important fact. This was a lesser magistrate defying a higher magistrate when it came to righteousness. Now, I got to tell you, like some people think, at what point do we actually like take up arms in defense of our freedoms, in defense of liberty, in the, in the defense of property? Like, when, when does that ever come? Well, i got to tell you, brothers and sisters, I, I, I truly believe this. How many know it has to come through, through a civil authority? God does not promote vigilantism. And he didn't give the church a sword. He gave them keys. Amen? Where's the sword come from? And who does it belong to? It comes from God and it belongs to the civil government. Well, Fob James was going to be willing to, to wield that sword to defend life, liberty, and property. And I truly believe, brothers and sisters, that there does come a time in that situation that every freedom-loving American who believed in these ideals could have joined the state troopers, could have joined the Alabama National Guard, and stood in defense of those freedoms. This is the lesser magistrate. This is what it looks like in real life. And that's the last example we've actually had where a lesser magistrate took that kind of stand in the defense of what we hold near and dear to our hearts as Christians in this land. Amen? Well, God has established four realms of government. Do you remember what they are? Self-government, family government, church government, civil government. Each has its own role, function, and jurisdiction. The authority any individual possesses in these four realms of government is delegated authority. In other words, they derive their authority from God. Their authority is not autonomous, listen, nor is it unconditional. Their authority is God-given and thus they have a duty to govern in accordance with his rule. When someone in authority makes laws or decrees contrary to God's law, they are in rebellion to God's rule. Now listen, brothers and sisters, I'm saying this, and one of the huge problems with the church of Jesus Christ is we don't have a biblical worldview when it comes to government or law. We don't understand these truths. So when we say Jesus is king of what? King of what? King of what? Kings. Lord of what? Lords. Is he king of pastors? Is he lord of bishops? But I'm saying the, yeah, he is. <laughs> but I'm saying the title. The title. Get the title. I mean, when it comes to Jesus Christ, he, yes, he has some ecclesiastical titles. Like he's the bishop of our souls. He's the great shepherd. But how many know most of the titles of Jesus Christ are political? King, Lord, Judge, Ruler, Governor. All political titles. So obviously he has an interest in what? Politics. So when the laws of men conflict or counterman the laws of God, we must obey God rather than man. Here's the standard that Christians for 1,800 years practiced. When the state commands us to do what God forbids or forbids us to do what God commands, we are to obey God rather than man. And here's the thing, brothers and sisters, if any human law countermands or contradicts God's law, it is no law at 
all. Divine law trumps human law. That's the foundation of Western civilization, brothers and sisters. And it's through, through that we get the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. So why is this important, this doctrine important to the abolition of abortion? Well, it not only has the possibility, listen, to end the Holocaust state by state, and that's the goal, to liberate America from blood guiltiness state by state, amen? But it also has the power, and this is, this is even beyond what we're thinking here, brothers and sisters, it also has the power to get back the nation that was bequeathed to us. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, this was once the authority structure in the United States of America. We the people. We were the highest magistrate. Did you know that? They govern by our consent. We were the higher magistrates. Then there were the states. And then finally, on the bottom, the federal government with limited and enumerated powers. We must understand it wasn't the federal government that gave us the states. It was the states that gave us the federal government. How many know this is really, really important? Okay, well, the problem is since Civil War and Reconstruction, this Federalist arrangement has been turned upside down. So now we have the Federal Beast. We have the states that have become mere provinces of the Federal Beast. And we, the people, are now on the bottom. Anybody ever serve in the military here? Bunch of pacifists. Well, there's an old saying in the military. Crap rolls downhill. And privates are on the bottom. Well, there's been a lot of crap rolling downhill. And it's suffocating the life, liberty, and property out of we, the people. So I want you to just expand a little bit, brothers and sisters, what we're talking about here. We, we are literally dealing with a situation where the feds, through the oligarchy of the Supreme Court, they are issuing pretend legislation and legal fiction which is enabling a social, malignant transformation without any representation. And this is where the doctrine of the lesser magistrate is absolutely critical for our survival. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the states to rise up, to exercise this doctrine of the lesser magistrate and to say no to the bully in the sandbox. How many when you were kids you had to face that? My fighting career began when I went to kindergarten. It was a first grader who put my hands behind my back and a kindergartner punched me square in my nose. And I didn't know what to do about it. Till I went home and faced my hardcore marine atheist dad. And it was on from there. Been fighting ever since. Here's the thing, brothers and sisters. If liberal progressive states can tell the feds to go pound sand in defiance of federal law, how much more should other states say no to the lawlessness and the iniquitous decrees when it comes to the two main issues for our national survival. 
which are the defense of innocent life and preserving and protecting the God-ordained institution of marriage. Isn't it amazing? You see what's going on like in New York and Virginia and some of these states like Colorado and California and New York State. These governors are literally telling the federal government, we don't care What laws you have on the books when it comes to marijuana, when it comes to illegal immigration, when it comes to sanctuary cities, when it comes to murdering children to the ninth month. And was it Virginia that was actually floating the idea of infanticide? Actually murdering the child outside the womb? Was that true? Russell, was that true? Did he... he, Brothers and sisters, when the liberals do it, when the progressives do it, nobody bats an eyelash. How much more should states lead the way and tell the federal government no? In other words, in the state of Washington, federal government, get it straight. We will no longer murder our children in the state of Washington. We will preserve and protect marriage. One man, one woman. See, they do it all the time. Nobody gets upset. And what they're doing, they're doing for evil. How much more should we do it? For the cause of what is good and just and right before our Lord. Amen. HB 2154 is a step in the right direction for Washington State. This bill that you have that Matt Shea introduced. Now, brothers and sisters, use this. Use this bill. It's a time to disciple. It's a time to mentor. It's a time to teach. It's a time to educate. Because one of these things that these bills do, there's a number of things that it, that it does that is so good. It will separate the frauds and the imposters from godly statesmen. Really, really an important process. Remember when we started off, we said this is not... And if, it is a when. And I know, I know God is using that. I know God is moving by his Holy Spirit to touch and change people's minds and hearts when it comes to these things. But we also have to understand the law is a teacher. It is a teacher. Okay? And this is our opportunity. To talk to our friends and talk to our neighbors, talk to our churches, talk to our legislators, amen, and begin to instruct them on their duty before God, both as the church and the state. We want the church to interpose in the culture and on the streets, at the death camps, at the IVF um, clinics. That is something that we as Christians must do. We must bring the gospel of the kingdom to the streets and the culture of our land. But the church also has to have a a mission to the magistrate. And we got to give them good stuff. We got to give them the right stuff, the stuff that they're getting from the pro-life movement. In fact, Russell... I when I, I I can't say the state right now, but the last state I was at, Concerned Women of America was represented there. Gave her the idea on your voter voter cards, pro choice, pro life, now abolition. Think about that, guys. I'm, I'm listen. Actually, create a, another category, another category, and when we create that category. Guess what happens to the pro-life and the pro-choice? They're both exposed. <laughs> what 
was that Grimly? Is it Grimly? <laughs> We're all surrounded. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's that? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? <laughs> no, but honestly, th be thinking about that too, because we got to reach our so-called Christian political people to understand th there's a new sheriff in town. There's a new kid on the block. And we're not playing the political game anymore. We're not going to allow pro-life pro, you know, pro politicians to check off their box. Boom, I got my vote. And we're not going to allow pro-life and pro-family uh, groups to make money. And so everybody gets what they want except the one who truly needs justice. And that's the pre-born child. And so, brothers and sisters... I want you to understand what you're doing here in Washington State. I know you're, you're small in number, but it's not the number. It's the truth. It's the truth. See, this passes the truth test. This passes the consistency test. And it's rock solid. It's rock solid, brothers and sisters. So take this opportunity... Get to know your magistrate. Sit down with him. Okay? Get good materials. Get the book, The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrate. Get the other materials to him. Okay? And begin to mentor. Begin to disciple. Begin to educate. That's the process we're in. We're like, we're like on this bottom basement right now, and this thing is rising. And this is our time. Okay? Like... Matthew said, don't go weary in well-doing. Keep casting the seeds. Keep watering. Keep swinging the hammer. Because it's not an if, it's a when. Amen? Amen. God bless you, saints.